human beings can not not learn. We always learn. Whether we learn good stuff or we learn bullshit, we always learn. We cannot shut up that mechanism in the brain. So the question is, what are findings in life science with regard to learning and training and education and do curriculum all over the world in all the universities you're working in actually consider and refer to these empirical findings? That's the question I would like to discuss. One of the most important findings during the last couple of years were running through Haiti. I'm mentioning him because it's the first and largest study ever done in human history on education. It's a meta-analysis of over 800 meta-analysis, 50,000 studies, including 80 million students, okay? So if you talk about education, at least you've got to read this and position yourself. It basically tries to include a lot. And this working group came up with 136 empirical variables by simply trying to answer the question, what works? What works to improve learning? What works to improve educational? What works to improve the learning curve? And what doesn't? And this is the first example of things who don't work, which are neutral or of little help. And you measure this by a statistical mean called effect size. An effect size is a statistical measure that tells you the difference of an intervention with regard to the standard intervention you're doing. So you do basically just standard procedure and compare it to something which is different. You have a difference of one uh, standard deviation. If you have an effect size of 0 to 0 0.1, it basically means just the general development in the society. If you have an effect size of 0 0.2 to 0 0.4, that's what we're doing anyway. And everything above 0.4 tells you empirically there is something going on. We have to look closer. And what you can f see here in the upper part of that graph is interventions, educational interventions like retention, a lot of long summer vacation, age bridging classes, preschooling classes, the size of a class web-based programs, they are either not working, of little help, or negative. Okay? So I'm not talking about a personal opinion about education. I'm talking about 800 meta-analysis on education. On the other side, if you look at the end of that graph, you find empirical variables above an effect size of 0.4, demonstrating that these variables work. They make a difference with regard to the learning curve. It's peer tutoring. It's feedbacking. It's metacognitive training. It's teacher's training. It's role taking. It's drill feedbacking. Why are such findings relevant? Because in the 70s and 80s in politics and in the general scientific debate, societal debate, the approach in education was basically driven by a so-called constructivistic, constructivistic perspective, meaning we put the kid, we put the student in an enriching environment and once he is in an enriching environment, he's going to figure out himself what's the best, and then we're going to have a good learning outcome. This is wrong. This is only true for the first five years of age. Until, the, until you enter uh, school, the first five years, you need only an enriching environment. You don't need preschooling classes. 
You just put the kid in an enriching environment and they're going to find out what's the best for them. But as soon as they enter school, all the way up to PhD classes, the situation is different. If you take all these variables together, you can see that personal and interpersonal variables out of 800 meta-analysis oversteer institutional variables by factor two. Here's just some examples. What you see on your left is that the mind of the teacher, what's happening in the brain and the mind of the student is by far oversteering other variables like institutional variables like the situation at home or the situation in the school. This is relevant when we talk about education. This is relevant because if it's true that it's not so much institutional factors but personal and interpersonal factors that make a difference on education. If that's true, we got to dig in closer and deeper into findings of clinical psychology and medicine in order to find out what really increases that learning curve. You can do that. Let's call it active learning. We call it in our uh, seminar in Dubrovnik, the creativity response. Why? There is huge empirical data showing that there is a possibility to make a difference on learning performance, on creativity, if you consider at least these six variables. Some of them might sound very trivial for you, but we have good empirical data for all the six of them. The first one is exercise and cognition. It sounds for you maybe trivial, especially the elder one of you, but it's really basic. You can, there's studies showing that you can increase the cognition speed processing in the hippocampus by simply implementing exercise programs in math classes. By interrupting a math class for five minutes increases the learning curve by a factor 20 or 25 percent. Okay. If you stood up here in the room now and would lift up one leg, staying on one leg only for 15 seconds, this would increase your blood flow in your brain by about 15 to 20 percent especially in the hippocampus. This is where memory is stored. Okay? If we had more time, I would be able to tell you more about the link between exercise and cognition. By the way, it doesn't cost a thing to implement. Second, there is a link between so-called mindfulness-based practices and the big data debate. You know, the big data debate is all about having as much data as possible. This big data debate actually goes back to Laplace in the 17th century, asking the question, can we, how can we better understand the world? And Laplace said, it's through a figure. It's through data. And the big data debate, if you speak to Google people, to internet people, it's just the same. If we have data on the world, we can better understand the world. The interesting part is if you look at human science, if you look at medicine, it's basically about how you can increase the prefrontal cortex. It's this part of the brain right behind your eyes. Is this part of the brain that, to a large extent, is determining your personality, your individuality? You can increase this part of your brain. You know what you have to do? Besides other things, you have to meditate. If you regularly meditate, you increase the prefrontal cortex. I can show you 
several dozens of programs, sort of mindfulness-based programs, from Zen to mind-body programs to yoga to Tai Chi to Qigong to thousand others, demonstrating the link of the prefrontal cortex and mindfulness and performance and creativity. The big data debate, it's not about information getting in your brain, it's about having the right filter to process information. The third aspect is about very trivial rest and sleep. We live in a 724, 724 society, and this means basically we're deteriorating our performance. You know, neuroscience can show that an average man needs seven to eight hours sleep, uninterrupted sleep. If you work in the evening with a computer with a blue light filter, you will have a different form of melatonin secretion with a different form of REM phases, with a different form of processing, with a different form of memory. When you sit in front of your screen, you basically think that digital learning will make the difference. From a neurobiological perspective, it doesn't. OECD studies from this year, this summer, we discussed them in uh, Dubrovnik too, could demonstrate that there was not one country in OECD that was able to empirically demonstrate that an increase in investment in screen or information technology in students has increased the learning curve. You know why? Because learning requires not only screen time, screen time, it requires multi-sensory, multi-modal components, like smelling, touching, visual, auditory, face-to-face -face interactions. The consolidation in the hippocampus is far too low if it's only processed by a digital screen time. For example, if you listen to me now and you are interrupting your attention every two or three minutes by looking at your, at your iPad or whatever you have, and you do that on a regular basis, you basically reduce your performance by up to 50%. That's what's happening in your brain, whether you like it or not. So the average, um, on a global level, the average smartphone user is using, using his smartphone 100 times a day, 100 times. The average student in a student class, uh, 70, 70 to 80% of the students in a normal average university class have their computer online or their iPad online, even though it's not part of the program, permanently being distracted. This cost them about 10% of their IQ. You can measure that. The fifth one is social competence versus competitiveness. We have very good data, neurobiological data, developmental psychological data, uh, central nervous uh, imaging data, that whenever a human being is able to build on social competence, this is always oversteering competitiveness. The ability for social competence of social IQ basically is one of the best predictors for future societal uh, success, more than IQ. You can learn that within the first couple of years in your life. And eventually we're talking about nutrition and supplements. Okay, if we had more time, we could do that uh, more in details, I just want to mention we have a several thousand year history and very good data on the simple fact that fasting is increasing the performance in your brain. Intermittent fasting, fasting. All religions on that planet implemented forms of fasting. Low diet, changes in diet, supplements. Okay. They make a difference. Regardless, by the way, this creativity response is regardless to the discipline you're working in. You can implement these six points, these six uh, variables, tomorrow morning in your class. And they do not cost you a thing.
but they all together will make a huge difference on education and learning. And if that's true, if it's true that personal and interpersonal is oversteering institutional factors empirically, and if it's true that the creativity in each individual is at least triggered by six variables on top of it, we then go back to the initial discussion we had about the future of education. I would like to discuss with you the following. You know, on average, it takes 50 years to, imp to change an educational system. It takes 10 years to implement it and 40 years for labor replacement on an average. As Hector said, we need 100 million demand on higher education. And what you see on this graph here is entering labor force the next 10 years is basically Northern Africa. There are 100 million people entering labor force. Okay, how are you gonna integrate them in a higher educational program? There's no way, just forget it. But Europe has something else to offer. We have, not only in Germany, but also in France and in Switzerland, in Central Europe, also in Poland, a 500 year experience of dual vocational training. A master student, a master uh, apprenticeship training. If you want to become a butcher, if you want to become a car mechanic, if you want to become a painter. In Germany, in Switzerland, it's a three-year training plus a five-year five -year master program where it's an interpersonal relationship between a master and an apprentice where a firm hires these people in order to get them educated. So I'm not sure whether we're going to make a difference with regard to integrating them in higher education programs, I'm advocating for a dual vocational training considering all these findings. Thank you.